You're listening to Mission Eve, a podcast that explores the stories of women who are opening the frontier of space to humanity. Your host is Megan Crawford, managing partner of Space Fund, a venture capital firm investing in the space industry. She is a mother, volunteer, founder, and true believer in humanity's future in space. Mission Eve is meant to inspire the girls of today who will be the women of tomorrow, leading our first permanent off-world settlements. Space needs women. Space needs you. Welcome to Mission Eve. I'm your host, Megan Crawford, and I am thrilled to welcome our next guest, Nagar Fahar, to our show today. Thank you for joining us. Thank you very much. We're really happy to have you. Um, I've been wanting to get you on the podcast for a while, so I'm excited (laughs) to have you here. Um, So let's start at the beginning. Where were you born? Where did you grow up? And did that have any, do you think that had any effect on your interest in space? Um... I was born in the U.S. I was born in California, in Southern California in particular. Um, It was, I think, the Irvine Medical Center, and I was raised in Long Beach initially, and then we moved to Orange County. Um, Beautiful parts of the world to grow up. It was beautiful. Um, I did, though, spend six years of my life in Iran. Um, And I think my interest in space stemmed from my love for airplanes. So because I'm of of Persian descent, both of my parents come from Iran, um, we traveled a lot as as a child. Like we would go on trips like every summer we would go visit like family all over the world because a lot of our family was displaced after the revolution. Um, So I would go to, you know, a country in Europe and then a country and then Iran and vice versa um, to visit family. And my favorite part of the trip was always the airplane ride. <laughs> so I would always have to get the window seat and check out what's going on. And both my parents were engineers. So I was fortunate enough that both my mother and father studied, you know, had technical degrees and um, were always teaching us about, you know, technical cosmetics, like how does the airplane work? You know, how does uh, a computer work? You know, I had a computer in my house since I was a baby because my mom was a computer scientist and electrical engineer. My dad was a civil engineer. So I think their influence had a lot to do with it. Neither of them studied space, but they did give me a really good technical foundation. And I believe that's what kind of influenced me in this direction. And then of course, my love for airplanes and my love for astronautics and aeronautics just kind of led me into uh, a career um, in this field. So I think that's what did it. Um, Another thing was probably, you know, when I was looking at all the different types of engineering I could study, I wasn't sure which one I wanted to do. I knew I wanted to study something technical in college. (laughs) And I looked at all the engineering. I'm like, okay, I don't want to do exactly what my mom did. I don't want to do exactly what my dad did. So civil engineering, electrical engineering are out. And I was debating between mechanical engineering and aerospace. And I'm like, aerospace, airplanes, yes, I'm going to do that. (laughs) And then... um, I ended up not going into aeronautics and, you know, working more in astronautics because I worked on a bunch of projects in college that were related to space. Um, And I'm happy I did because I feel like, you know, that's the place to be right now. So excellent. Excellent. Um, Were there any defining moments or influential people in your childhood that helped kind of point you that direction? You talked a lot about your parents, which sounds wonderful. And to have a mother with a technical background, so few of us in, at our age are, are blessed with that, right? Right. Um, but were there any other defining moments or people that really kind of made you think, yeah, aerospace, space is where I'm going? Not really. There weren't any other people in my family or or relatives or friends that I knew that were working in space. Most of my exposure to space and the possibilities of careers in space came in college time frame. Um, Everything that led up to that was mostly just projects I was working on. Like I like working on water bottle rockets in high school and, you know, any project um, that came became available was you know, I would hop on it and, you know, try. I love trying new things. Um, and I think something that really drove me to want to try everything new and take advantage of every opportunity I had was going to high school in Iran, actually, because when I was 10, we moved to Iran. Oh, wow. And I lived in Iran from when I was 10 till when I was around 17. So um, I, went, I did high school there. I went to middle school there. And just seeing the stark contrast between the education system in the U.S. and all the opportunities that people have here versus what they had there really motivated me when I came back as a junior in high school to take advantage of every opportunity I potentially could and, you know, learn as much as I can. You know, I was in every society I I could find just to kind of experience and kind of help shape 
the future of where I want to go. And I felt like the more I, I would experiment and the more clubs I joined and the more projects I worked on, it would steer me more in the direction of what I want to do in the future. Um, so AIAA was really instrumental in college for me. Tell us what that, what that stands for. Uh, the American Institute for Aeronautics and Astronautics. Um, I was a member of them. They had design, build, fly competitions. And that actually was a big steering point in my career when I kind of experienced, you know, leading a project, you know, our university. I, I went to Cal Poly in Pomona and our university had never done one of those competitions before. So, you know, I heard about it and I was like, oh, we should do it. We all should do it. And they're like, oh, nigga, we've never done this before. We've never built an aircraft and flown it in these competitions. And I'm like, no, we, we have to try. And we got a big group of people. It was like 20, 30 people involved. And we all went to the competition and built an aircraft. And unfortunately, we flew the aircraft into a tree. <laughs> so we didn't win the competition. <laughs> but it was a great experience. And um, our professor was the one who was piloting the airplane at the time. And he was like, so, so apologetic. Cause I'm so sorry. You know, <laughs> you guys worked so hard. <laughs> and now it's demolished. But it was one of the best learning experiences. And, and it was funny because in that team, I realized what really was exciting to me was the raising money part and managing the project. And, um, you know, I was going around, you know, asking for corporate sponsors and we raised like five, ten thousand dollars to do it and fly everybody to Wichita where the competition was. And I think that was a big turning point in my career in general, where I kind of learned like what skill sets, you know, I thrive in and what I get really excited about versus what I don't. And I found that, you know, project management, leading teams, fundraising, and the business side was more interesting to me, even though I was studying aerospace engineering, that was really interesting to, um, experience. And, and I'm happy that I got all those opportunities to kind of help me figure out like, what, what do I thrive in? What do I really enjoy doing versus what I don't? So I think, if I'm giving recommendations to women in the future, like as you're growing up through your career, as you're a student in school, take advantage of every opportunity you can. And in the experience you get from taking advantage of those opportunities will help, you know, clue you into what kind of future career is, is right for you. And I feel very fortunate that I was able to take advantage of those opportunities. And, and I think part of it is, is the drive I got from being in a different country and realizing how many opportunities there are here in the US and motivating me to like put in 120% in all of them to see, you know, how far it can take me and, you know, in my career and, and it worked. So that's wonderful. That's wonderful. Yeah. Um, so tell me a little bit more about your time in Iran and, and kind of, uh, you know, you, you tell this great, beautiful story about how it made you appreciate America so much more, but were there any kind of defining or, or exciting moments when you were there that, that maybe kind of helped you, you know, it seems like you were maybe destined for a STEM career because of your parents, but, <laughs> but, but is there anything there that kind of helped push you along your path? So I, I realized when I was there that um, I'm not really big on like poetry and liberal studies and stuff like that. Even though Iran has beautiful literature, beautiful poems and poetries, um, I realized that wasn't for me. I didn't like memorizing poems. I didn't <laughs> like reading all those things. And biology was not a field that I was really into either because I'm morbidly afraid of needles and blood and <laughs> I see it and I just faint. I'm like, oh no, I can't do that. So when I kind of like, you know, I kind of went down the list of like the things I could do. And, and in Iran, it's interesting because you make that decision actually right before you go into high school. So once you finish middle school, when you go into high school, you have to pick whether you're going to like a liberal studies type of high school, a technical high school where you study engineering and physics or a more bio uh, focused field where, you know, it's kind of like a pre-med, et cetera. And right. you start that really early. So I had to kind of go through that exploration process really early in my career. And that's when I picked like, STEM. That's why I was just like, yeah. no, I want to study engineering and physics and learn more about those fields. Um, it doesn't mean that in the engineering technology focused school, you don't study chemistry and biology. and stuff. You do, but there's less of an emphasis on those and more so on engineering, on calculus and all that stuff. And I think that kind of put me on the right path. And then when I moved to the U.S., it was easy because I had already studied all the calculus and everything people would study here. And, you know, as a senior in high school, I studied that in like the first year of high school. So it was, it was like a cakewalk when I got back because <laughs> they have a very vigorous program there. 
Um, so one, I think, was that, that the decision had to be made early and I had to explore those kind of things earlier in my career. Um, and also um, just seeing everything that was happening in the space industry and in the aeronautics industry versus the others, I felt like you know, the engineering STEM fields were much more exciting and there was much more opportunity and much more advancements and I could, you know, invent and find new things to do. And, you know, um, and yeah, that's kind of the influence that I felt like Iran had. And it was great. I am so grateful to my parents for taking me there. And when they told me when I was 10, I was in fifth grade, they were like, we're going to go to Iran. We're going to move like the summer. I was depressed. I was so sad. I was like, I don't want to go. All my friends are here. I'm going to go to science camp this summer. How could you? <laughs> like, I was like super concerned about science, science camp, camp and the yeah. fact that I don't get to go away for a week to, to the science camp. <laughs> and I was like really angry. And, and the first year was very hard because everything. In transition. In, yeah. Yeah. Like I didn't, you know, speak the language perfectly. I was reading and writing at like a first grade level where I was supposed to be in fifth grade. And it was really hard the first year. But I managed to, you know, get through that. And that really helps kind of like set me on a good trajectory to like work really hard and, you know, really, like I was saying, appreciate, you know, all the opportunities available and, you know, go from like an average B student to like an A student that was working her butt off. Like before that, when I was in the U.S., I was just kind of like everything was a given. It's like, oh, yeah, this everyone yeah. gets this like no big deal. I don't have to work that hard. But once I went through that, I realized, wow, you know, like I wasn't taking advantage of everything that was there and I was missing out on a lot. And once I got taken out of that environment, I'm like, oh man, like, no, I, I, I need to really, you know, focus and, you know, study hard and, you know, build a career for myself. And it was, it was really good. So by year six, um, when I was almost about to finish high school, I told my parents, I'm like, okay, no, we have to go back to the U.S. now because I'm going to go to college there. And then the whole family moved back <laughs> because of me. Because <laughs> I was just like, oh, I want to I study in a technical field and I want to go to the university over there. And, you know, I think that's, that's where the future is going to be. And uh, we have to move. So then they all moved with me. <laughs> so it was good. That you is know? good. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, um, you know, I... I feel very fortunate that I had those opportunities and those, that learning experience and, um, and that solid foundation really helped like a solid foundation in engineering and physics and math and, you know, having it like drilled into me for like three years in Iran in a very vigorous program really helped make it easy when I came back where I was just like, oh yeah. Like when I got back, they were like, oh, Negar, you know, if you, if you want to take a math course, you should probably just go take it at the community college. Like you don't need to take these high school level <laughs> classes That's anymore. Awesome. Yeah. So it was great. It kind of gave me a leap ahead. And then when I went to college, it was easy because I had already studied half of those things previously in high school. So it was good. And, um, and if I have any advice for students right now, it would be to, you know, not slack off in high school and make sure that, you know, again, you take advantage of all those courses that are available to set the right foundation for you going into college so that you don't start your first day in college, like never having taken a college level math course and, you know, um, and, and take that struggle away so that, you know, you can walk in and feel confident and, you know, contribute immediately and, and, and take the college level courses. Um, so it kind of like sets you ahead. Um, and, and since those resources and classes are available in high school, like take the AP courses, like, you know, work hard. Don't just like chill. Like I found a lot of people in high school here were just, I, I didn't actually have a lot of friends in high school because I would just get very frustrated with them and them just being like, Oh no. And, and I was, I was growing up in like a beach town and everyone would just go surfing and chill and, you know, come to school in their bikinis and didn't really care what was going on. And it was a very frustrating environment for me coming from, from Iran and, yeah. and the environment that I was in. So that was, that was hard. The year and a half of high school, I went here, but then as soon as I went to college, it was, it was perfect. Like everybody was very motivated. They were there for a reason. They're like, okay, we're going to study. And that was really, um, in an, an eye opening experience and, you know, college, I, I had tons of friends and everything was fine, but yeah, 
high yeah. school here was rough. Yeah, and, and really, you were still in that transition phase too, coming back from, yeah. yeah, yeah. So yeah, it must have been tough, yeah. It was tough because everyone had been in high school already for like three years and I come in in the middle of the year, like right, everyone's yeah. already formed their cliques and they're doing their thing and, you know, they didn't really, you know, care about the new kid on the block and, and that was rough. And, and I'm a very social person, so I was just kind of like, oh, this is crazy. <laughs> and I went from like an all girls school with uniforms and form very formal education to like beach town high school <laughs> in, in Dana Point where everybody was just kind of bumming and having a good time yeah. didn't really care about school and you know and, and the thing that was really shocking was how they didn't have respect for their teachers and institution and they were just like so rude in the class and I just I would get very frustrated with other students and I I, I couldn't really understand where they were coming from um, so yeah, that was rough, but in college, of course it wasn't like that. So it, it, was, it was a good turning point for so me. So you had a good experience in college? It was perfect. Yeah. Excellent. And you just, uh, you did four years? I did four years. I was on this like four year program to like graduate. Um, they had this thing at Cal Poly where like, if you commit to, you know, graduating in four years, they would let you, you know, sign up for classes first. Cause they were in, in, they had an impacted program. There was too many students, not enough classes and professors. So it was really hard to get your classes. So I, I signed up for that and I just like, I'd be taking like 20, 25 units a quarter and killing myself. <laughs> now looking back, I'm like, I don't know why I was killing myself. <laughs> Again, like I'm saying the drive I got as, right. as a young student, like really helped like kick it off for me and be like, no, this is serious. Like I'm not going to like slack off and wait my time here and, and my parents' money and, you know, and education, not learning. So, um, yeah, that really helped, um, get me through the system in four years, all the, um, societies that were available. Like I joined the society of women engineers as a freshman. That was a great society. I got to work on projects with Raytheon. When I joined, there was no, um, in-flight entertainment system, for example, and, and all the seats, you know, how there's oh, the, yeah, the, little, yeah, yeah. the personal <laughs> thing. So the project that I worked on as a student, um, at Cal Poly was how do you implement that system? How do you figure out a system where you can distribute the power and communications and, and all the data signals and everything in order to enable the airplane to have a private screen for every person? That's really cool. And yeah. Well, and thank you. Cause I really appreciate <laughs> that, especially on those long international flights. So thank you very much. <laughs> Yeah. And, and that was awesome. And I got to do projects like that as, as a freshman in college, which was awesome, you know, to, to work with teams on implementing those kind of systems. So, um, I really appreciate, you know, all the opportunities I got through society of women engineers. I got most of my internships and stuff through that. AIAA was awesome for all the projects we got to do. And, um, you know, there was so many other societies that really helped the career a And Cal Poly itself was great because everything was hands-on. You had to do a bunch of projects you had to build airplanes, design satellites, like, you know, they have CubeSat projects and, you know, so it was really good, um, you know, again, basic learning experience. And it's so different than like Stanford. Cause I went there for my grad school and, um, it was a more academic institution versus Cal Poly, which was more hands-on and you're going to build it and learn through building it. Whereas Stanford was more theoretical. I mean, they, they were one of the founders of the CubeSat program as well, but it wasn't as emphasized in their educational system as I felt like it was at Cal Poly. It was like a requirement that every class had a lab and you had to go build these and break it and right. learn from it and fail and land flat on your face and get up and try again. And, you know, <laughs> I was like building like, um, uh, wings for, um, UAVs and, you know, sitting in there with the pre-preg and s inhaling all these gases, which were making me high. And I almost like passed out in the lab because I didn't know what I was doing. <laughs> then, then laying it out and inhaling all these like nasty fumes. And I'm just like, Whoa. And they're like, Oh, you know, you're actually supposed to wear a mask when you do these. Like, Oh no, I didn't. <laughs> So, you know, these like little lessons. Important they, lessons. Yeah. yeah and yeah. they're like, oh, okay. And then like, we're like, okay, well, how do you design a wing? And we're like, um, I don't know. Like, okay. Well, we'll start from a piece of foam. We'll shave it off. We'll put stuff on it to stiffen it. And, and you know, those projects teach you so much more than you do in any of the classrooms and, right. you know, from the books and stuff like that. So, um, I feel very fortunate to have gone through those kind of programs and, um, to have 
learned from them so much, you know, straight out of college, I felt like I knew exactly how to design a satellite and build an airplane and feel confident in my abilities to work on a team to do it and figure out how do you divvy out the responsibilities, where everyone's strengths are, where everyone's weaknesses are, and how do you get everyone to come together to, to build something. And if you just work on academics, you never get that experience. And it makes it really hard in the workplace to do anything. So, um, that was great. And and I felt like anybody from Cal Poly that we ever hired at any of the places I worked were like stellar. They'd walk in and they knew, you know, exactly how to contribute. And it wasn't like, it was like, okay, you know what, that's enough analysis. Let's just build it. They were just, you know, they're like, okay, we got it. You know, we're going to go do this and make it happen. Make it happen. Right. So tell me about your time at Stanford. So at Stanford, um, again, it was a great learning experience again. Um, and I ended up going there, uh, part-time because I was working at Lockheed Martin full-time first and then at Space System Solar Isle, which is not called Maxar Space System. So I did that at night. Um, and it was great. They had like an online program and for the labs and stuff, you can go in and, and do the labs and, you know, tests and stuff and you could do everything online. So it was, it was a very flexible program. You know, all the lectures were recorded online. You could go watch them whenever you needed. You could, you know, collaborate and things of that nature. So, um, that was a great program and it was like, you know, I was doing that like 20 years ago. So, you know, they've had their online programs for a long time wow. and kind of figured out yeah. how to do that, <laughs> which is great. It, but looking back, I feel like I would have gotten a lot more at a Stanford had I not done it part-time. Right. Like if I had to go back and do my education again, I would probably still go to Cal Poly. And if I chose to do Stanford as grad school or any grad school, I would go full-time. Like I wouldn't have done the part-time thing because it was hard to get a lot out of it when I had to work like a 40, 50 hour week at work and then go home at night and study and take exams and work on projects and stuff like that. It was really hard to have that dual focus. Um, I did a full-time master's, but we interacted a lot with the people who were doing the part-time because they had full-time yeah. jobs. And I always respected them so much because <laughs> this is, because the full-time master's itself was hard enough, but to try and do it with a job. Oh my goodness. Like I, a lot of respect for that. Yeah, Thank absolutely. You. Yeah, it was, it was rough. And, um, my husband was going through it at the same time with me. Well, at and least you had somebody to commiserate with, yeah. right? <laughs> and he was working full time and doing it too. So we break it basically never saw each other. It oh. was pretty intense. <laughs> it was a hard three years of my life. <laughs> so if I had to ever do it over again, I would just like quit my job, do that for a year and then go back. Yeah. Um, I feel like that would have been better use of time than dragging it out to three years and trying to do it kind of piecemeal. Um, I did learn a lot from that. And actually the quality of the professors and the education was great. Um, but as I said, I didn't get the full thing out of it. And maybe had I gone full time, I would have decided to stay on and do research and, you know, get a PhD and stuff. Cause one of my professors really wanted me to, but I'm like, I can't, like I'm working full time. Yeah. And, and it's really hard once you've kind of gotten a taste of like being independent and, you know, having your own housing and stuff like that to go back to being a full time student. student. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Cause I, I basically graduated from undergrad, worked for two years and then I went back to get my master's degree. Cause I was working at a research institute, um, for Lockheed Martin and everybody I was working with had a PhD. So coming into that group with a bachelor's, I felt like insufficient. I'm like, Oh no, I don't even understand half the things they're talking about. <laughs> I'm like, okay, I have to go back to school. And, um, that's when I decided I'm like, okay, I'm going to, I'm just going to apply to Stanford. And it's like right around the corner. Cause I was living in the Bay area at the time and, uh, I'm going to get the higher education so that I can feel like I can contribute appropriately. Um, and it did help. And I'm really happy I did that. I just wish I would have just quit my job and done it full time versus right. the part time thing. And, you know, I never know. I might have done a PhD too, but it didn't happen. Next, um, uh, next life. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. There you go. Um, so tell me a little bit about that first job at Lockheed Martin. The first job at Lockheed Martin was interesting, like um, straight out of Cal Poly, like in, in the summer. No, it was probably like February. They gave me an offer. I'm like, okay, I'm going to do it. (laughs) And then they're like, okay, we're going to relocate you. And as I'm moving to Northern California for the job, um, I get a phone call and they're like, Nagar, um, you know, we think, uh, we're worried that you're not going to be able to get security clearance because of your time in Iran and stuff like that. So we can't actually hire you. So tell the movers, 
take everything out and, you know, we have to retract our offer. And I was just like, okay. So I go and tell the movers, I'm like, can you please unload the whole car? And, um, you know, I'm not, I'm not moving. And then an hour, it takes the guys like two hours to do this. (laughs) And then I get a call back two hours later. Oh no, no, no. We're sorry. The recruiter didn't know what he was talking about. No, no, you do have a job here. Please tell them to move everything back. (laughs) <laughs> the movers wanted to kill me. <laughs> and those were some two very stressful hours because as soon as they told me, I was like contacting all my other, you know, offers because I had offers from Jet Propulsion Laboratory and other places that I'd interned to work too. I'm like, hey, you know, is that still offer on the table? I'd like to, you know, yeah. and it was, it was a whirlwind to start my career. There. <laughs> but I did and I ended up like not going through the security process, security clearance process and actually working on their like commercial process programs. So I worked on their commercial spacecraft programs, which was a great learning experience. They had their assembly integration and test facility in Sunnyvale. So I was working with multi-ton satellites, taking them through, you know, the assembly area where they assemble the communication system onto the bus, and then they deploy and test the solar arrays. They put them through thermal vacuum testing and then vibration and um, acoustic testing and basically simulating all the space environments. And I was like a lead engineer responsible for taking the satellite through all of that. So within my first two years out of college, I learned a ton about, you know, how satellites work, you know, because if you're at the end of the line, not on the design side, but you start on the other end, you learn about all the design flaws, and uh, what right, people right. potentially <laughs> did wrong and what they couldn't do better so that it survives all the tests. And it was, it was a great learning ground. Um, I also got to work in the research lab for a little bit. Um, if you recall, I was worked on that in that side of the team uh, before I went back to get my master's. And then uh, when I got accepted to Stanford and decided to go to that program, um, working in assembly integration and test wasn't really an option because that was like working around the clock, like 60 to 80 hour weeks. You had to work every weekend. I had to request my weekends off. Wow. It was very intense job. I learned a ton. It was a great experience, but I couldn't go to school in the evening and then do that kind of job. So that's when I decided to, um, you know, go work for Space Systems Laurel in their, uh, in a different division in their like systems engineering division. And I, I picked it like an easy job where I wouldn't have to work more than 40, 50 hours a week. And I had my weekends to study. Excellent. And, and that's when I transitioned over. Like two, after two years of Lockheed, I went to Laurel and it was great. And I was just like, okay, I'll go work for Laurel for like two years and then I'll move on. And I ended up staying for like 13 years. It was great. <laughs> <laughs> but it was such a great environment. It was like being part of a family. It was really nourishing. And, you know, every two years I did change my job, but just within the same company, I, I changed from doing systems engineering to working on uh, program management and product management and our solar array teams, managing all the production we were doing there to working in our product strategy group which I was fortunate enough to work under the CTO and working on all the new leading edge things and figuring out how we're going to diversify our business, you know, working on really cool cutting edge uh, proposals. And while I was in that team, um, SSL actually won a lot of work in like satellite servicing and, um, you know, basically a, a lot of small sat work, which was really cool to be part of and figure out how to diversify a company. Um, and then I worked and then I moved into BD because after working with proposals and customers is when I learned that I really want to work with customers. I love people. I love the, you know, the business development process. And then I got recruited into our small side division at SSL, which was really fun to work with, you know, figure out a new customer base in a new industry in the new space industry for an old heritage player. Um, so that was really fun. And I did that for a few years and then Mikhail recruited me to Momentus. So Last tell us year. about tell us about Momentus and what they do. So at Momentus, we actually um, provide uh, connecting flights in space. So the way it works is just like a connecting flight in an airplane. You know, um, it's cheaper than a direct flight. We're just taking that exact same business model to space, and the way we're taking it to space is the first leg of the ride is a rocket. And then the second leg is our transportation services. And we can transport satellites from, um, you know, LEO all the way into a geosynchronous orbit, or we can transport them all the way to the moon or Mars or beyond. And the coolest part about our company is the sustainability aspect of it, because we've chosen water as our propellant. So we have water plasma propulsion, which is really fun. Um, And basically we're 
able to turn uh, water into plasma using microwave energy and then um, use that energized plasma and put it through a converging diverging nozzle to generate thrust. So we get a system that's very, um, very efficient and very powerful and we can do trips really quickly. So I hope one day I'll be able to transport you to Mars with our vehicles. <laughs> I appreciate that. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, so what advice would you give a woman who's, who wants to break into this industry, who wants to come into the space world? Um, networking is very important. Um, soul searching and figuring out like what makes you tick and what makes you excited and what doesn't is very important. Like, as I said, I had to go through that process really early in my education, like right before I even started high school, like figure out, okay, what do I really like doing? What, and what do I not? And trying to get as much experience early on when it's really cheap and easy to, to switch around. Like I did three internships. I did internships for aeronautics companies for, um, space companies. I got to intern at JPL and, you know, experiencing every career that you might potentially dream of doing as early as possible when it's very easy to shift and do it in small spurts is really important. Um, and through networking, you'll find people that you could potentially like shadow, go get tours of their facilities, talk to them about what they do, what a day in their life looks like and figure out, is that really for you or not really. Um, right. I think that really helps in terms of figuring out, um, is, is, is a career in this industry, right? And I personally think I'm biased, of course, <laughs> that now is the perfect time to get into the space industry because it's booming. It's being democratized. Um, everybody is working on figuring out means to get more people into space, to get more resources into space, to really commercialize space. And it's already happening. Like, look at the number of startups that are, you know, working in this, in this There's thousands field. of them now. It's, it's amazing. Yeah. Right. And I never thought when I started my career that I would be able to work at a startup in space and it's become a reality and it's been such a crazy roller coaster. but I really, you know, if you're looking for a career in space and you're a woman, I really think startups are, are a great option. So have you had any challenges as a woman working in this industry? Yes, many along the way. But I'm happy to say that uh, I was able to overcome them. I mean, I've had professors that didn't think women should be engineers. I've had professors stalking me. It was very, very strange, like coming to the dorm room looking for us. Like, you know, um, I asked one for a letter of recommendation, a letter of recommendation once. <laughs> And he asked me to come to his house to get it and then tried to invite me into the pool. And oh. it was very, oh. very bad. Uh, like he tried to uh, tell me that, oh, yeah, I, lo I, I love women with dark hair and I'm going to get this airplane and, you know, we live on it. And I'd love for you to join me. And I, it was too much, too much. Yeah. <laughs> um, so I've had those kind of experiences. And then I've had experiences with people who just didn't think women would cut it. Like I would give the same, like on a homework assignment, I would provide the same answer as one of my male colleagues. And I would know because we would work on teams on these in the evenings and submit it. And they would get a higher grade than me, even though we had the exact same answers. Um, so there was, I felt like a series of discrimination. Um, but I'm happy to say that over time, I feel like it's gotten a lot better. Those old professors have retired. The ones with bias are going away. And I think that now the playing field is much more even. Um, and, uh, you know, one thing that I wish would change is I even found a lot of women were discriminatory towards other women. It wasn't just men. The women didn't want to help each other. Um, I mean, some of the societies, like Society of Women Juniors, et cetera, were great, great resources, great ways of encouragement and places you could go to get help. But I had other classmates that felt like, oh, I, I don't need to give back. I had to go through all these hurdles. So everyone else needs to too in order to really make it. So I've had, you know, classmates and colleagues that didn't care about other women making it in the field, which I feel is unfortunate. Like, and it's not just against women, like minorities had the same problem and, um, 
I feel like now that there's all these resources and places where these people can go to get help to make sure that, you know, that stuff gets resolved, that it's getting better. And just the population in general is more aware of these things and working harder to resolve it. Like I can tell you, like I volunteered a lot for Society of Women Engineers, even after I graduated, I was very active when I was at uh, Lockheed. I was like the president of the Society of Women Engineers chapter in the Bay Area. And we would have uh, events for like you know, middle school students, elementary school students. And I would oftentimes ask, so girls, you know, what percentage of engineers do you think are women? And they would be like a hundred percent, like 50%. Like, <laughs> and it, was, it was really cute. I was just like, oh, you know, and what's uh, the actual number? Do you know? The actual number is less than 20. So right now the aerospace industry is 25% female. I think aerospace industry is doing better than yeah, the actual than engineering overall. That's interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and I think actually in academia, it's better now than it is in the working world, but right. I don't know the exact stats as of this year, but I know when I was in SWE, we didn't notice a huge amount of progress from year to year in terms of the enrollment of women in engineering field and stuff. I mean, we were working hard to address that. Like right. there was programs where we would bring girls onto university campuses, you know, underprivileged girls who weren't even thinking about going to college and we'd bring them onto university campuses. We'd put them through two weeks of like STEM activities and lessons all taught by women and a hundred percent of them would go to college. And then of that, I'd like 50% would chose like STEM fields. So there's a lot of activity going on, not just through SWE, but through a lot of great organizations that are really focused on you know, solving the STEM problem in the U.S. And I think it's a problem even with the guys. It's not just women. I mean, obviously yeah. there's not enough women too, but, you know, minorities and stuff, they don't like see it as a future career for them. And I think one reason is because they don't see enough role models doing it. And I was fortunate enough early on in my life to see that. And, you know, my mom is an exception to the rule, right? There aren't that many people with mothers who are engineers. And I also find a lot of women with mothers who are stay at home feel obligated once they graduate and, you know, start a family to stay at home like their mothers did. And like any, a lot of my friends who had that growing up feel like they'd be doing their children a disservice from working and decide to stay home. And I see that trend opposite with my friends and family who had the other experience where their mothers did work and they feel fine doing it because they grew up and they realized everything was okay. Yeah. So um, that's, a, that's an interesting trend I'm noticing. Um, and I don't know how to address it, but, um, uh, it's, it's an interesting nut to crack and figure out like, how can you encourage women to say, Hey, it's, it's okay to, you know, have children and have a career. Like I would go to Japan a lot for work and there were women there telling me, Negar, you're so lucky to live in the U S and I'm like, why? And they're like, you can have it all. I'm like, why can't you? They're like, no, we have to pick between having a family and having a career. We can't do both. Wow. And it was very unfortunate. And these were project managers and people higher up in the company. They're like, yeah, we had to choose between that. And that's why we don't have a family and we don't have like that support system. And we feel like you guys are so lucky to, to have that. So, um, I find that most of us in this industry are pretty passionate about what we do. We're pretty passionate about this cause. Um, and oftentimes, um, People dedicate uh, some of their off work hours to to causes that are related to space or related to to women's issues. What what causes are you passionate about? What do you do outside of outside of work? Um, I'm very passionate about like women in engineering and um, increasing the percentage. And as I said, I I did you know, elect to be the president of the Society of Women Engineers for two years. And I was very active in our local division. Um, I like to go to classrooms and teach directly to children. So when they have, um, you know, engineering week, e-week, I'll go to classrooms and I'll teach the kids about engineering. Um, you know, I have friends who are teachers. So, and there's also a discovery e program where you can go and teach directly to the students. And I feel like that's very effective. Um, so I'm very passionate about, you know, getting kids exposed to STEM as early as possible. Uh, like my own daughter, for example, she's like, mommy, I'm going to be the first kid in space. I'm like, that's great. That's great that you have that ambition. Right. And you think that that's, you know, that's going to happen for you. I'm like, no problem. You know? Um, so 
I'm very passionate about those kind of things and, and try to do as much as I can. Of course, for the past year, it's been very hard working as part of a startup to do a lot of that that I like to do. Um, so I, I try to be as involved as I can and, you know, we'll support like SGAC and, you know, other, Tell us what that stands for. the space generation advisory council and, um, you know, do events with them, which is geared on young professionals and students, um, and other organizations that are kind of supporting the same causes, because I think that that's fairly important in terms of um, building the talent pool to go forward, encouraging people into it and, you know, mentoring people in this field. So Excellent. I feel very fortunate to have had great mentors in my career who have really helped me get to where I am. And I try to kind of pass that on to others as much as possible. Wonderful. Wonderful. Um, so what do you do for fun? Oh, I love dancing. Oh, that's wonderful. <laughs> I love going out dancing. Um, and uh, I love going to dance shows. Both of my daughters, they do ballet and Persian classical dancing and things of that nature. I like sports. I love snowboarding, going into the mountains, hiking, biking. I used to do triathlons before I joined a startup. <laughs> <laughs> my startup is like my whole life right now. It's like engulfed everything. Yeah, they do that. Uh, it's they, not, yeah. abno not abnormal. Yeah. Yeah. And um, I love traveling. I love going to different countries and, you know, meeting new people, experiencing different cultures. And, and my latest obsession is bread making. Oh, I'm interesting. Like making bread every other day, sourdough bread in particular, and figuring out how how I can make it gluten-free and figuring out, you know, food sensitivities and addressing that. So a, a lot of different obsessions, but yeah, those are just some. That, that sounds great. <laughs> that sounds great. All right. And then this is a last question that we ask everybody. When the time comes to settle space, will you be amongst the first to go? You know, I have to say no. I would like to go to space one day but I don't want to be part of the first batch of people. <laughs> <laughs> you want to wait till it's tried and true and tested and yeah, yeah, understood. If somebody gave me a free pass to go tomorrow, I don't think I'd go. And I think part of it is because I feel responsible for, you know, I have two children, I have two daughters, one's five and one's seven, and I want them to have a mother growing up. Um, and uh, I wouldn't feel like a responsible parent if I did that. <laughs> <laughs> But um, even well, we're not quite there yet, so you've right. got some time to get the kids grown and right. out of the house. Yeah. <laughs> if they were 18 in college and settled, maybe. Yeah. Um, and also, you know, it was never an ambition of mine to be like an astronaut straight up. Like I know a lot of kids grow up thinking they're going to be an astronaut and stuff. And I think it would be great to go to space, but um, it was never like a dream that I must be an astronaut and I must go to space myself. Um, I feel very really fortunate to be part of the team of people enabling that. And I hope one day in my life to go, but definitely not the first batch. And I'm definitely not going to Mars anytime soon, given the radiation <laughs> environment and all the risks involved. Would you? I, yeah, I, I'm ready. I'm, I'm ready to go. Really? Well, my kids are almost grown, so yeah, okay. I'm ready. I, I I would definitely go in a heartbeat. Awesome. Yeah. No, it's great. Great that there are people like you. No, and we have we have people in our company that have like signed on to be astronauts too. Yeah. So there are a lot of people excited. I'm just not batch number one. <laughs> I, I'm generally one to like hop on the bandwagon and try new things and all of that. But at the end of the day, I still feel a, a sense of responsibility because my children are really young. Oh, there you go. No, yeah. And, and, Talk well, to well, me in 15 years. I was going to say, we'll get you out there eventually. <laughs> and I think by that time, it'll be tested for 10 years and everything will be good. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. I'll, it'll I'll be like getting on, your... on an airplane. It'll be super safe. And I'll, I'll go on the 10th trip with you and we can go together. There you go. There you go. I'll come <laughs> back for a visit and then we'll, I'll take you, I'll take you out. Yeah. <laughs> Perfect. That sounds right. awesome. Well, thank you very much for joining us today. It's been an absolute pleasure chatting with you. Um, thank you for having me. Um, you're welcome. I think the fact that you're doing this is fabulous. And if there's anything else I can do to help, let me know. Will do. Thanks. Thanks. Mission Eve is a production of the Center for Space, Commerce, and Finance, a 501c3 nonprofit dedicated to educating entrepreneurs and investors about their respective challenges and opportunities as it relates to space. Megan Crawford has been your host and executive producer. Aaron Pagel is the executive director for the center and producer and editor for this episode. Marketing and communications for Mission Eve is managed by Nikki Martinez. Theme music has been composed by Liz Fole. 
If you'd like to support this podcast, please visit patreon.com slash mission eve to become a monthly subscriber. We have multiple tiers available with benefits like personalized thank yous, access to limited edition t-shirts, opportunities to engage with our interviewees via online Ask Me Anything sessions, and small group gatherings with Megan Crawford when available. Any support you can offer will go a long way to helping us continue to tell the stories of the women who are making life in space a reality. Please follow us on Facebook at facebook.com slash Center for Space, Commerce, and Finance, Twitter at CSCF underscore nonprofit, and LinkedIn at linkedin.com slash company slash CSCF. Thank you very much for listening.